Good evening and welcome to the August 4th, 2011 Planning Commission meeting for the City of West Sacramento. On the side table over there is a copy of the agenda with the packet along with request to speak forms. If you wish to address the Commission this evening, you need to fill out a request to speak form, even if it's for items not on the agenda. Um, if you have uh, multiple items you wish to speak on, please indicate that on the form. And uh, I'll call you in order that I receive them. And uh, for fairness, we uh, typically allow three minutes per, per speaker. So um, with that, uh, we generally start the commission meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. And tonight, I would like to honor the uh, birthday of uh, Commissioner Moore by having him start the uh, Pledge of Allegiance for us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States Okay, first, uh, first item on the agenda is uh, for presentations by the public for items that are not on the agenda, but within the jurisdiction of the Planning Commission. And actually, I have no, no request to speak on uh, general items. So um, I'll take it to Charlene for uh, staff correspondence. Thank you, Chairman Levy. Um, on July 20th, the City Council um, considered the West Coast Recycling uh, Project appeal. And I just wanted to update you and let you know that they upheld the uh, Planning Commission's approval of the project. And then uh, you should have a memo from staff on item number four, which is the uh, workshop on the wireless telecommunications policy. And then also uh, just a reminder to everyone that there are still some audio uh, difficulties. And so we're, we're gonna be doing some microphone sharing. So if there's difficulty hearing, uh, let us know. It'll remind us that, uh, for instance, the city attorney and I are sharing a microphone. Staff will pre be presenting from the other side of the room uh, where there's a microphone that's working. Or they might present from the podium. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, at this time, uh, the commission should disclose um, ex parte communications. Uh, planning commissioners need to disclose uh, any, com uh, any communications they've had uh, with um, applicants uh, on the agenda. And seeing none, we will move on to the consideration of approval for the minutes for the July 16th, uh, 2011 commission meeting. I believe it was June 16th. Was it June 16th? Is this, okay. is this on our agenda? <laughs> it was June 16th. You're right. <clears throat> sorry. I'll move approval. Second. Uh, uh, sorry. Moved by Commissioner Sandine. Uh, seconded by Commissioner Moore. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Uh, any nays? Hearing none. Uh, oh, that's it. And uh, Joe, Joe abstains. So first item on the regular agenda is public hearing regarding the Applegate tentative parcel map. Uh, and that will be uh, discussed by Ms. White. Good evening, Chairman Liebig and members of the Planning Commission. The, the applicant seeks approval of a parcel map to subdivide a four acre parcel into two lots. The project site is located at the northeast corner of Harmon Avenue and Harmon Road and Hillary Avenue. Parcel one would be approximately 2.05 gross acres and parcel two would be approximately 1.95 gross acres. The applicant is also seeking approval of a variance to uh, exceed the maximum three to one lot depth to width ratio. And this ratio basically means that the length of the lot cannot exceed three times the width of the lot. The applicant originally submitted a parcel map um, to, sub to, to subdivide the property into four one-acre parcels. However, that four-lot configuration could not meet the Yolo County's Environmental Health Department sewage disposal requirements. And so the map was revised to comply with the county's requirements, which created lots that exceed the maximum three-to-one lot depth-to-width ratio. The proposed lot depth-to-width ratios are 
3.55 to 1 and 3.34 to 1. There are several lots in the vicinity of the property that exceed the uh, lot depth to width ratio. Um, these lots have a 4.5 to 1 uh, lot depth to width ratio, so approving the variance would not constitute a grant, grant or special privilege. The staff report discussed various alternatives uh, for reconfiguring the tentative map, but none of the alternatives achieved compliance with the county's uh, sewage disposal requirements. So, you know, staff therefore believes that this is a unique circumstance, given that there are no viable alternatives for the project to comply with the city's, re the city's requirements and the county's requirements as well. Uh, since findings for recommending approval of the tentative map and the variance can be made for this project, staff recommends that the Planning Commission conduct a public hearing, certify that the Planning Commission has determined that the negative declaration is the appropriate level of environmental review under CEQA, and finds that the negative declaration represents the independent judgment of the city, and approve the requested tentative parcel map and variance subject to the conditions and findings as identified in the staff report and waive condition number 12 regarding the undergrounding of the existing overhead utilities. And this concludes my presentation. The applicant is available in the audience in the, in the event that the Planning Commission has any questions as well. Thank you, Sandra. Um, given that the applicant is here, does he or she wish to actually address the, the commission? No, okay, thank you. Um, well, at this time, I do need to open the public hearing. I have no request to speak. Um, however, I will keep it open for a short time in, in the event that the commission has questions for the applicant. Um, at this time, are there questions of staff? Mr. Chair, yeah, um, yeah, a couple of questions. Uh, one, I was just wanted to get clarification: is the proposed new par property line just to the west of that multi-car garage? Do we know? I drove by; it was hard to tell from from the map exactly. Maybe the applicant would. Uh... It's dividing the two homes. There, mm -hmm. There's two. As she mentioned, there there are two homes in the property, so there uh, there will be one home on one home in each lot. Okay, one that, structure, as I recall, had multiple uh, garage doors on it. Was, it. was the property line just to the left of that building? Mm, it, no, the, the brick house. And yeah, the um, garage. I'm sorry. If we if we were actually going to um, uh, have you answer questions, could could you actually come up to the podium and speak into the microphone? And because this is being recorded, uh, if you wouldn't mind just sharing your name um, as um, before you before you begin. And thank you for coming up to answer the questions. Yes, I'm Linda Kimsey. Thank you. So your applicant's daughter. Uh, regarding the question, the um, the brick house, two-story brick house, and the four-car garage are one part one part property, and then the ranch-style house is where my mother's living, and that's the other property. So it would be between. There's trees like between the two. It would be, um, you know, between the two homes. I think I understand. Thank you very much for that clarification. And I have one other question for staff. Any other questions for the applicant before she goes? Okay, thank you. Um, were all setbacks met after this? Yes. Lot, lot okay. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, they had the blessing of the Environmental Health Department on this one. Anybody on this side? Okay, I have a couple of questions for staff. I'm um, sorry, Joe, did you have a question? Okay, go. I'm sure if you could hear me or not. The portion of the property, is it working? Sorry. The portion of the property that's gonna be abandoned, I'm just trying to, uh, is that the, kind of that little sliver that's sticking out on the bottom of the map? Yes. Uh, and that just what? City takes ownership of that, or what happens? That's going to be the portion of the um, Antioch Road that's encumbered by oh. this property. That's what's going to be abandoned. Okay, so maybe I, I didn't. Understand not not the entire road. No. Okay, just that no. It's just road. incorrectly shown. So there's a condition that says that ne that needs to be corrected. Okay, so I did. I guess I maybe you can explain the the abandonment piece to me. That might be a, a learning. Uh, um, can you explain the abandonment? I had the same question. Uh, by abandonment, the city 
specifically does the city take ownership of that that property no the abandonment means let me let me, let me go to that condition what's happening is that right away is set aside right now for the city so the abandonment actually is taking that property and putting it back into the ownership there you go the, the private ownership and so Antioch is not planned to be a roadway in the future. So we actually have some plans to bring forth uh, abandonment along several sections. Okay, so this and is And we have Mark Collier from Development Engineering who's here who can speak more about future plans on Antioch if, if you're concerned about that. No? Uh, no, I was actually just trying to understand what you what the, the term meant, abandonment. Were they abandoning it or was the city abandoning it? Uh, the city is abandoning it. And so when we have a public right of way and we abandon it, basically, if typically the property line goes to the center. And so if we were abandoning the whole thing, half of it would go to the Applegate property, the other half would go to the property across Antioch. So it goes, it goes back to adjacent properties in an abandonment process. Does that answer the question? Uh, yeah. I think it does for me, as long as this is consistent with the city's plans to abandon that entire strip. Yes. Okay. Um, there's, there's only a couple things um, that I would like to maybe suggest. Instead of wa waiving condition 12, do we use our standard condition language for delaying um, until such time that the city wishes to underground that area? I know where this is, so I would imagine this is going to be a long, long time away. In the rural residential area, rural residential, rural estate, and agricultural, I don't believe there were ever any plans to underground. Okay. Um, the road section doesn't allow for it um, currently. So it would be a significant change to city standards. Um, where I could see it could be a potential for undergrounding in the future, which has happened in some areas of the rural estates, uh, for example, over along Marshall Road, where the Planning Commission has considered this condition before. Um, there was an actual uh, a general plan amendment rezone. So it would seem like there would almost have to be a rezone opportunity uh, and then, then you could have another, op you would, if there was a reason, you'd have another opportunity to uh, request the undergrounding. So that's why we put, the, uh, we put it in. Um, since this is rural, we didn't want to miss it. Okay, I will withdraw my request then. But, you know, the commission, that's something you, it's all within your purview to consider. Unless, it, um, unless anybody would like to entertain that, I'll withdraw my request. All right, one more question. Um, Sandra, the uh, minimum lot size is noted as being uh, one house per one acre in this area. Um, is that with use of clustering? Sorry, you said one, well, I heard you say that um, the, one house, one the minimum house per lot, lot size is 0. One. 0.5 to one, one acre um, in the, mm -hmm. per household. That's um, density. Mm -hmm. And Okay, uh, it, is that, um, is the one acre criteria dependent on clustering in this no. area? Okay, no. so so that is, at what one. point is it 0.5, um, a half of a house per one acre? In other words, one house per two acres. You listed a range of the, uh, the density for this uh, zone. I'm just wondering why there's a range. Oh, I'm that's sorry. the density. Yeah, that that's that's correct. That is the density. Um, but we're typically seeing one unit per acre. Now, you can also have. I don't want to muddy the waters for you. You can also have second units in this zone as well. On on a prop, okay. On a property, um, so in other words, this this property, for example, is four acres and has has two two units. Uh, we're dividing it. You will have. One, one unit. property with 1.9 on 1.95 acres and one property on two. Right. That's correct. Um, I want to make sure that, uh, that it's with, it's within this density. Yes, it is. Yes, okay. and that's without even a requirement of clustering. So correct. Thank you. Um, I think that is 
that's it for me, for my questions. Unless there are any other follow-up questions? No, I will go ahead and close the public hearing then. Thank you again. And um, I will uh, look for a motion. I'd make a motion that we affirm staff's recommended action. Second. Okay, it was moved. All right, uh, who, who did second it? I did. Well. Okay, um, it was moved by Commissioner Moore, seconded by uh, Commissioner Mace. All in, Commissioner Chase, all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any na no's? Hearing none, uh, passes unanimously. Thank you. I don't think we need to hear the appeals on that one, do we, Charlene? Uh, yes, actually, we Thank you for reminding me. Uh, for tentative map appeals, any interested party may appeal the decision of the Planning Commission in this matter to the City Council by filing a written appeal with the City Clerk within 10 days of tonight's action. The appeal must be accompanied by the appropriate filing fee. Okay, thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is number three, public hearing regarding a modification to final map. This is for the property on West Capitol Avenue. Um, and Ms. White will also be giving this presentation. Uh, the applicant is seeking modification of a final parcel map condition that requires the undergrounding of the existing overhead utilities. And this project site inv involves three parcels totaling approximately 4.85 acres. Um, parcel one is already developed with the Valero gas station, mini market, and a truck stop. Um, the tentative parcel map was approved by the Planning Commission on uh, April 17, 2008. And one of the conditions of the map requires that all uh, existing overhead utilities along the project frontage be undergrounded at the time of site development unless weighed by the Planning Commission. The final map was approved by the City Council on November 5, 2008, and the map was recorded on December 16, 2008. Request to modify or amend an approved tentative map are typically appealed to Planning Commission within the uh, appeal uh, period, time frame. In this instance, the applicant is seeking modification of a final parcel map that has already been approved by City Council and a map that has already been rec recorded. And based on staff's recollection, this is the first application where staff has processed a request to modify a condition on a final map. We have consulted with the City Attorney's Office and we were advised that the Planning Commission could consider this request. The applicant submitted a building permit in September of last year to demolish the existing uh, Valero Mini Mart and construct a new AM PM um, convenience store and car wash, which triggered compliance with the requirement to underground the overhead utilities. The property owner is seeking a deferral of the condition until the hotel site is developed, and that hotel site is slated for parcel three. Uh, for financing purposes, the applicant wishes to defer the undergrounding until parcel three is developed with the hotel site which is slated to uh, occur in the fall of next year, 2012. The Planning Commission has approved the deferrals in the past uh, for previous projects. Uh, deferrals were approved for the Bridgeway Lakes North Besting Tentative subdiv Subdivision Map and the Jefferson Plaza. Uh, we do not feel that tying the undergrounding to a specific time frame would be practical for this project in the event that Parcel 3 is developed. Um, in the event that for whatever reasons development uh, is delayed on parcel three, this could possibly compel the property owner to come back to the planning commission again to amend the condition. Since um, all the findings for recommending approval of this map modification can be made for the project, staff is recommending that the, the planning commission conduct a public hearing, <coughs> find that reliance on the previously certified negative declaration is the appropriate level of environmental review under CEQA, and modify the condition of approval to underground the existing overhead utilities along the West Capitol Avenue project frontage for this project. Um, this concludes my presentation and the applicant is in the audience and I believe would like to make a, a, a presentation to the Planning Commission. Okay, uh, before I open the public hearing, actually I have a question for um, Sandra. 
Uh, Sandra, you mentioned parcel three and the hotel. Uh, in my recollection, the hotel was on the property that went all the way back to the levee and was also adjacent to the bike path um, next to the crane. On your map, I'm reading that as parcel two and parcel three would have been the Burger King. I'm sorry, um, it's parcel, it's, the hotel site is on parcel two. Am I correct, Jesse? I believe it's parcel two. Okay. Parcel three was uh, was supposed to be um, um, uh, slated for development of a, a drive-through restaurant. I'm right. sorry, that's my that's my error. Okay, and uh, the the trigger is the, the trigger occurred the trigger on parcel is, one. Okay, so um, the requested trigger is still parcel three, which is a, a quick serve restaurant, which the commission has already approved. That's correct. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions, other questions of staff before I open the? Just okay. a quick one. I think it's really just a clarification because I think it is pretty clear in the conditions. But I've heard the word "wave" being tossed around, and I think we're we're specifically talking about a deferral. Deferral. I'm sorry if I mean, if I said "wave," I didn't mean to say "wave." It should be Thanks. deferral. Thank you. Deferral. I actually, have one more question. Said was the def the deferrals that you said that have been approved in the past were those on tentative maps? Uh, for the, the yes, one was a tentative map and Jefferson Plaza. I think that was for a tentative map as well. So that's just the, that's the main difference here: tentative versus permanent. Exactly. Yeah, those maps had not been they had not been final, nor had they been recorded. Thank you, Sandy. Um, Sandra, I have a question about the expiration of our actions, and it's it, we have a 36-month window. Will this, if we take an action tonight, does that? extend does it reset the clock no, because the, the then then the project itself will go outside of the time frame so they'd have to come back anyway is that no this map has already been finaled right so that's it's 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 i know this is a unique animal okay the map has already been recorded this map is done so that 36 month period to it's record not, the map that's not, gone that's that condition has been satisfied okay. most of the conditions of this map has been satisfied um it's, yeah, I know it's unique, it's different, but in this instance, you know, typically you would see a request come forward to the Planning Commission at the parcel map stage mm -hmm. before it's approved by the City Council, before it's recorded. But in this instance, this map has already been recorded, it's final. There's this condition out there that, you know, is being triggered by a building permit. And so, so the staff has no concern that this is precedent setting? No, we consulted with our city attorney's office, and so because we it, it is it is very unique and different, and okay. so that's why we consulted and we were advised that we can, you know, move forward on this request at this, you know, with the planning commission. Council. <laughs> so, yeah, we did talk about this. This is a pretty unique situation. I think my view on it is the condition referred specifically to unless waived by the planning commission. Normally, one would expect that all tentative map conditions are either satisfied or deemed to be complete when the council approves the final map. However, in this case, we're operating under a condition that expressly reserved to the Planning Commission a right to waive that. And so I think this seems like a reasonable solution uh, that was acceptable to the applicant and got the city where it needed to go. But we are, this is a fairly um, unusual one. So I'm hopeful this is not going to establish any kind of a pattern that we fall into. So, so no, Charlie, this is not a precedent. We don't. So, so I might understand the conditions and the actual map, or sort of separate them. Well, uh, uh, are they Ms. all, are they all part of one piece? Is a legitimate one. Is that normally a tentative map has a life, but that life, uh, that's a, during that period of time, they have to final the map they did find the map during that period of time so where this would not be this doesn't extend anything because the tentative map had already reached the point where the final map was approved this is sort of a, a lingering condition attached to the project and so you're, you're exercising the discretion that was reserved to you to uh, rule on specifically on the question of underground one final question for me Oh, and um, Ms. actually, well, I'll take mine first. Um, Sandra, are we allowed to change the um, amended condition tonight, or we're, are we um, limited to vote on it up or down? 
You are allowed to amend staff's recommended condition. Yes, you can. Okay, you can amend what we've proposed. Okay, thank you. Mr. Moore? And I, I guess I only have one question for you, Sandra, and it, I don't know, <coughs> it kind of talks about the hotel and parcel three, but parcel three, of course, being the restaurant is the trigger point of this. Are we assuming that he's going to build the Burger King first and then the hotel second? Um, the, uh, I should have mentioned in my staff report. Or should we just put down if either one of those parcels are developed, it kicks in the underground? Well, I think for financing purposes, it works, and he can elaborate on that. It makes uh, more sense for the hotel site to be developed, uh, and then at that point, he's, he's, he's willing to but and able site to. Too. Yeah, I'm sorry, yes, to, um, at that time, to underground the overhead utilities along the project. But wonder if he builds the other one first. I mean, that should, if either one of those are on the, that parcel we subdivided, if either one of those develops, that should trigger starting the undergrounding. I don't in, know. In my opinion. Yeah. Right. But it's been represented to us that for financing purposes, uh, the hotel would, you know, generate the well, income. God, I'm not a banker, so I can, I can hardly wait to hear this one. So it'll be fun. Okay, okay. we'll wait. I think uh, that would be great to hear during the del deliberation. Uh, similar questions and comments. So at this time, I'm going to open the public hearing. Uh, the applicant wishes to speak, and I do have one one request to speak as well. I'm not sure if it is the applicant, however. So uh, again, if you could just state your name uh, for the record. Thank you. Members of the commission, Peter Tobin with Barthausen Engineers. And um, this is kind of a strange situation the, the civil engineer that was part of the project as part of the part of the parcel map was quote somebody else and that's a huge condition of approval he should have said something to the owner um, anytime you have a final map you're going to have a subdivision ordinance condition <coughs> like that i fully understand that he never red flagged it for him that's really what's happening here so what we're doing is we need to amend this um, it's a little bit of a strange situation in front of that site because you're dealing with a Caltrans encroachment permit with detector loops for traffic. You're dealing with um, traffic controllers, signal boxes, multiple utility, um, multiple utilities out there. Every time I go out there, I find something else. So it's, it's very, very complex. And uh, we're actually in the process of getting an encroachment permit and we're really looking forward to, to getting that and actually building and starting November 1st. So that's, that's our goal here. In terms of the condition of approval, um, yeah, I mean, the, the either two or three, it probably should say two or three, the condition, because they're gonna run, um, they're gonna get built at the same time because the motel and fast food are gonna kind of feed off each other. Um, so if, if you're looking to, to amend the condition, that's probably um, what to do there. And it, finally, we're just asking for some relief, so we, uh, Thank you for your uh, guidance here. Um, but before you go away, sure. actually, uh, since you do represent the applicant, uh, I'll ask the commission if they have any questions sure. of, of the applicant. Seeing none, okay, thank you for your time. Sure. Um, at this time, however, I will close the public hearing and um, we can uh, deliberate and uh, ask staff any re recommended questions. Um, because I, I think Charlie had a really great point, um, mostly because I agree with it. Um, <laughs> uh, I've, I've actually already uh, penciled in some notes for how, how this could be worded, so I have some, some suggested text um, if the commission does wish to go that way. And it's simply by adding um, either parcel two or three be developed. Um, uh, and parcels two or three, in a sense, um, if the commission wishes to go that way. Um, I mean, money Mr. Chairman, get if us I could, I mean, it, the applicant agreed that that's probably fine because they'll develop them at the same time. But I mean, the reality is, if we're granting him relief while he remodels the Valero into an Arco, that's fine. But if you build something new on that site, on the site that we subdivided, then I think either one of the lots would trigger the undergrounding aspect of it. So, I mean, that would make common sense to me. But I, and I think you could do it by just adding if where it says three, you just put two and three, if either two
two or three develop. But I would rather defer to our attorney who knows everything, he said, to make sure that we can do something like that. Yes. Yes, you can. Uh, I think you could do uh, that first sentence could be revised to say shall be placed underground at the time that the first of parcel two or three are developed. So not the most uh, grammatically perfect sentence, but I think it conveys the meaning. And then in the second sentence, two or three, located on parcels two or three. I'm seeing nodding head. Um, I am seeing a bunch of nodding. I, I have uh, one comment. We, we have learned uh, from one project that decided not to subdivide and then construct and then wish to subdivide that undergrounding became extremely expensive at that point. Um, so just a side note that it is often or probably better to, to prepare or to underground during construction if possible because going back and doing it um, Will, could could result in uh, higher expenses. So, if I can add to that, we're actually. I, I will, as, hold on. I yeah. actually have to open. The, oh, okay. Reopen the I public kind of hearing. Uh, okay. Yeah, as part of the Arco um, civil engineering plans, we're actually going to install the conduit, so we don't have to come back and disturb the Arco. So the Arco gets built. We gotta we gotta tear out the frontage and just at least put the conduit in for the future pulling of the electrical. So we're we're doing that. Okay, yep. thank you. Yep. Great foresight on that one. Uh, Mr. Chase. Just a suggestion on that. I, I don't know if this would uh, affect it at all, but uh, given your comments, would it make sense to, to tie this rather than to the word developed to occupancy uh, to allow for that undergrounding during construction as opposed to prior to? I think occupancy is already tied to it. Sure. Yeah, that is in the last sentence of the condition, that it has to be completed prior to the occupancy. Okay. And that's that's um, pretty much our standard for improvements. Any other comments, questions, motion? Mr. Chairman, with the added condition of parcels two and three, I would make a motion that we affirm the recommended action of the staff. Moved by Commissioner Moore. Seconded by Mr. Galvan. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any nays? Hearing none, uh, passes. And Ms. Sharp, our and Charlie. so this is a bit unusual, but it is tied to a tentative map. So we're going to um, read the appeal for a tentative map. Any interested party may appeal the decision of the Planning Commission in this matter regarding the uh, change of the condition to undergrounding to the City Council by filing a written appeal with the City Clerk within 10 days of tonight's action. The appeal must be accompanied by the appropriate filing fee. And just a note, I had to reclose the public hearing because I had accident, well, secondarily reopened it, so it is closed. I know, I'm stumbling all over the place. Okay, moving on to number four, uh, public workshop on the wireless telecommunications facility policy update, and this will be Kathy Allen. Good evening, Chairman Liebig and members of the commission. Um, the city's wireless policy was adopted in 1997. It has not been updated since that time. There have been numerous requests from this commission to update it as well as various members of staff. Uh, so we are finally bringing you an updated draft of the ordinance. Um, some some issues we're trying to address in this. Um, we're trying to clear up the issue regarding single purpose monopoles. Um, there is a statute that allows them in some areas as close as 500 feet or within 500 feet of residential if technical evidence can be supported. However, there's been uh, some clarification needed uh, regarding what single purpose actually means. Staff has always, <coughs> <coughs> okay. 
staff has always uh, interpreted it to mean a poll that will accept only one carrier um, and we'll we'll get to single purpose monopoles a little further on when we get to the changes in the policy um, public safety um, has become an issue in regards to wireless coverage uh, due to the fact that the majority of 911 calls these days come from a wireless phone. Um, it's been estimated that as many as 25% of the households um, no longer have a landline and so making sure that the infrastructure is there for proper wireless coverage is a very important thing. Our own uh, Fire department employs a reverse 911 uh, system for emergency calls to its citizens. Landlines are automatically enrolled in that. However, wireless phones are not. The fire department is preparing a system where they will be able to enroll uh, wireless customers in the nine reverse 911 system probably by the end of this year. Um, with a significant portion of the households not having a landline, this will be very important and it will be added important that the coverage is good throughout the city so that when those calls go out that everyone will actually receive them. There are currently uh, 23 wireless facilities in the city. 17 of them are in the north part of the city, north of the Barge Canal. There are six in Southport. Oops, went the wrong way. So this shows, this shows Southport here and what we're trying to illustrate on this diagram has to do with if there was a prohibition from having a cellular site within 500 foot of a residential area, exactly what would be left in terms of an area to put them. The green hatched area is the area where they would not be allowed. So effectively, if there was a 500 foot prohibition, all you're left with in Southport is Southport Industrial Park. Um, it's probably not adequate to reach the southern two villages when they build out. And so staff sees this issue as an issue that could become significantly important as the city builds out. With those issues in mind, um, we looked at where we could change the ordinance to try to make something that would improve the infrastructure and also be something that hopefully the citizens that live in the city would find palatable. Um, we majorly changed a few sections. Uh, the first one being prohibited facilities. Um, we basically struck the whole section to make it so single purpose monopoles were not allowed. We really want to make sure that co-location is the way that we go. And so we want to, in our new policy, make it so that co-locations are required on all new facilities. On permits with zoning administrator approval, um, we struck the whole first bullet. That was because in 2007, uh, the state enacted SB 1627, which eliminated review for co-located wireless facilities. Um, as the city no longer has the ability to require a discretionary permit, that's why we removed that section. Subsection in that same area of the report, subsection 
G sections D and E. Um, we would now be requiring a wireless telecommunications facilities permit. The staff report says use permit. Uh, that was left in in error. Um, to qualify for that, the facility is going to need to eliminate a gap in their carrier network. There must not be superior sites available and the applicant must be able to demonstrate that service is going to be improved in an area that's currently underserved. On the section labeled major permits, which used to require a use permit, we're proposing changing that to a wireless telecommunications facilities permit. And this would actually have its own set of findings unique to it. We did not include them in the staff report. Uh, findings that we are proposing as a starting point uh, were given to you in a memo tonight. Just briefly to sum up for the audience, there, the, to the maximum extent which is feasible, the proposed facility has been designed to be compatible with the community, that the facility is necessary to close a significant gap in coverage, that the applicant has submitted a statement of willingness to allow other carriers to co-locate on the wireless facility. The wireless <coughs> facility is consistent with the general plan and zoning ordinance and that the wireless facility complies with all requirements of state and federal laws, regulations, and orders. Uh, we would be happy at the close of our presentation to get your, your feedback on that, as well as with the rest of the application, obviously. Finally, just to sum up, uh, we eliminated the facilities master plan update section of the ordinance we really don't use that anymore. All the information we require there is obtained in the application itself. So it was just a duplication of application of information. So we've stricken that from the policy. The wireless telecommunications facilities section, it was changed to require all new facilities to accommodate co-locations. However, the applicant doesn't need to have all the carriers under contract at the time of application. And because of this, single purpose facilities are now permitted, or prohibited, excuse me. And finally, we did add a third item to address the SB 1627, which prohibits entitlements for co-locations. Uh, the final thing we changed was had to do with the emissions conditions. This section was stricken due to changes in state law, which state that no state or local government may regulate wireless facilities on the basis of environmental effects of radio frequencies. This concludes my presentation. I look forward to hearing your comments, suggestions, I'm happy to hear what you have to say. Okay, thank you, Kathy. Um, again, this is a public workshop. Uh, this is not a hearing, so, um, and I actually have no request to speak this evening. Um, before we get into um, questions, I, I would like to know that the, uh, the report was, um, uh, I found it very helpful, and it uh, clearly identified and demonstrated the need um, for this type of policy change uh, and demonstrates po uh, need for the actual uh, infrastructure down there, which I think we were stumbling over um, at, uh, finding that on our last hearing uh, on this type of thing. So um, actually, Kathy, I have a question before we even get into it. The uh, piece of paper we have in front of us, uh, I know that you, you read this and the findings. I'm not sure where it goes. In, in, in where do we insert this into the staff report? Um, it would be the findings that are attached to the wireless telecommunications facilities permit. 
Okay, so these would be the findings that you would have to, uh, that would have to be met. Yes. In, in for zoner administrative action or approval or for conditional use permit uh, if it came in front of the commission? Uh, there would, for wireless facilities, there would no longer be a use permit. This permit replaces the use permit, hence the new findings. Yeah, we would be creating a new section in the zoning ordinance. Mm -hmm. um, and so we would no longer uh, apply the conditional use permit findings to a wireless telecommunications permit. We would come up with new findings specific for that permit. And that's what the, this draft was uh, uh, meant to give you an idea of what those findings might look like. Look like. And we would return with what that uh, the zoning amendment that includes the findings when we return to you in public hearing format for recommendation to the city council. Um, under the, uh, the policy, um, section G, the permit D and E actually reference a conditional use permit though. So yeah, that is an error that needs to be stricken. That needs to be stricken. That, yes. Okay. So it would refer to a wireless telecommunications permit and the findings associated with that. Gotcha. The comments. Uh, Mr. Chase. Actually, some questions for you, uh, Kathy or Charlene. Um, so, uh, and it's really on the permitting process. We're eliminating the conditional use permit. And I think we all know that a conditional use permit, once those conditions aren't met, can be terminated, uh, I think legally. Um, I, I'm actually referring kind of to um, paragraph L in the staff report. I'm not sure what the page that's on. Uh, periodic review required. And, you know, it, it discusses triggering termination of the permit. Um, if it isn't a conditionally used permit, uh, and it does mention that it requires a building permit uh, in here, um, I, I think a building permit is typically not rescindable legally, to my understanding, um, once it's been issued. Will there be something in this new wireless permit that will, similar to a conditionally used permit, I guess, allow it to be rescinded if, if certain conditions aren't met? Yes, we can do that. The whole reason for pulling away from the conditional use permit is that the conditional use permit has the public health and safety findings in it, which we can no longer apply to telecommunications facilities. And so we still want to maintain, we don't want to change the conditional use permit findings because that applies to a whole other series in the zoning ordinance. So that's why we're coming up with a new section specific to telecommunications facilities. I, and I so our, our approach would be to have this permit some, uh, act in the same way as like a use permit, but within the parameters we're allowed to regulate for telecommunications. Then I guess along those lines, I would probably think, uh, I would suggest we modify or add an item six to the, um, the findings that, that Kathy has given us that, that in fact provides some grounds for withdrawal of that permit. I don't see anything in here that I would think legally could say you can go out and take that permit back. Well, um, that'll probably be something that we'll have to, uh, that'll be noted and we'll come back with that. Uh, we understand uh, what we're kind of hearing from the commission. I mean, the, the typical for a use permit, you, you, when it comes time to consider revocation of a use permit, it's not necessarily because the findings can no longer be made is typically because you violated the conditions of the use permit. So to the extent there are conditions added to a wireless permit, you would have the same opportunity, but it would be based on a violation of those permit conditions. Uh, we don't typically go back and revisit use permits because 10 years later, somebody questions whether it's still necessary or desirable. That's not a, that's not really a basis to revoke a use permit. So but I think in this case, Jeff, what we're thinking, then, I mean, it's good to use something current. We had someone that wanted to put a pole up down by Tower Mark, and they only had, they thought one user, or they did have one user, and but it was set up that it was going to be a multi-user pole. So if in some frame of time, two, three years, five years, 
they didn't have multi-users on there like they said they were going to have, that would be a basis to revoke the permit. That might be difficult because you're what we tried to do, I think, when I talked with Kathy about this, and this is still a workshop, so we're, it is a work in progress, but the idea would be that the focus is on uh, prohibiting the construction of a facility which is not designed to accommodate additional users. It's really difficult to, to put out an expectation on a, on, a, on a party building this in the first place that they have to find someone else to go on there within a period of time. <coughs> What if no one wants to use that hole within that time period? You're, so you're really you're you're looking to revoke based on circumstances that may be outside their control. Thank goodness this is a workshop. You can look that up. Yeah, <laughs> let's see. Um, on, on I mean, that, it would be if I could. It would be similar to, to somebody coming in and saying, "I want a use permit to be able to build a restaurant with a drive-through." And we say, okay, well, you can build it. So they build the facility, but they can't find a tenant that needs a drive-through. And we want to revoke the use permit, not because they didn't complete the construction within the period of time, but because they can't find the right tenant. That makes and sense. And that would be a problem. Over there is a condition that staff um, shouldn't be permitting any new poles within 1,000 feet um, if there is space available on a pole. Um, Thousand feet actually isn't very far. Uh, perhaps we wish to increase that. Um, it's, it's another thought. I mean, I think you're at a workshop point here, and I think what we should do is throw out a couple ideas and then let staff look at it, you know, and see what. Our yeah, and I think are. I think that concept is okay so long as there's a safety valve that says the applicant can come in and explain why that won't work, why locate co-location on that particular facility for some reason isn't feasible or doesn't provide the coverage that they need or there's some other issue. I'd go along with that. Okay. I mean, I, I think that the philosophy behind this, as I understand it, is a developer coming in for a shopping center and requiring that you will have tenants in all of your spaces by a certain point. And of course, we can't do that. So it sounds like it's a similar kind of a thing. As long as it's built to accommodate them, I think we've accommodated that. I would think that uh, <clears throat> the independent builders would, you know, seek out tenants, uh, but could a, a carrier that built the pole make it sort of cost prohibitive for somebody else to come in? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> those are some of the practical questions that I'm not sure I have an answer to and how the negotiations go on between carriers or the, you know, there's always the question of what if somebody just makes it prohibitively expensive for someone else to use it? And that's a difficult one. But while you're right, I, I understand that there could be a lot that would, you know, go into that. But that, that's, you know, something that worries me a little bit. This is something that we are seeing a lot of jurisdictions go to. Um, uh, we've Kathy did quite a bit of research on other jurisdictions, and we're continuing to find. Um, new ordin you know, ordinances that have been updated, and many of them are uh, prohibiting the single purpose and requiring co-location, and there's a, a variety of means by where they're trying to ensure that that happens, by either requiring the applicant to actually submit a statement indicating that they will be making these spaces available for co-location and how many. Um, there is uh, a clause in one of them that is similar to what uh, Chairman Lee uh, indicated about um, not allowing another co-location to go up within so many feet of one that still has uh, space available. Um, so all of those things are what we're seeing in other jurisdictions where the, where the industry is kind of going. So great feedback. Sure, Lynn, on that note, actually, one thing I was reminded of on this one was the freeway sign uh, ordinance that we have. And on that, there is a non uh, or an anti-competitor exclusion um, condition on that. And I believe there's something on, uh, on the thing that they have to sign that says they can appeal to the city um, if, they're, if they feel they're being excluded. Um, so I was just going to suggest maybe looking up that sign permitting uh, language. 
Yeah, we can certainly take a look at that. Um, and there are some similarities because of the, uh, particularly if we start drawing sort of geographic boundaries and saying, you know, no new facility within a thousand feet of another facility that has a co-location opportunity. They're a little different because the, the issue with the freeway signs Here we really felt that it was necessary to uh, sort of insert ourselves. That would make success, but sort of insert ourselves into the process by which the city remains But you're right, there are some similarities here. Uh, the other thing that occurs to me, and I don't know exactly how to talk about it, is that you have um, a limited number of carriers. Carrier makes it difficult for everybody else to locate on their signs. They can probably expect to get that that response back from their competitors the next time they want to go. If you have a condition like you're describing that would say enforcing this co-location requirement by making it more difficult that may force them to cooperate. I, I guess a question for Charlene. Um, the, the last, the um, uh, tower monitor adjacent to um, uh, tower that came in was apparently a third party speculative venture to then go out and, you know, try to find uh, carriers to put on it, which, you know, is fine. Has that been fairly common or have most of the other towers in town been developed by a specific carrier? Or do we know? I just wonder if there's a trend in terms of how these are developed. Been about. 50-50. We do. Versus carrier. Yes. Okay. Seems like we are seeing more third party though of late. Um, the uh, you you made an interesting comment about the freeway sign, and the um, desirability because of the limited number of them, and that's sparked a thought that we are not limiting the number of these towers um, in this planning process and just doing the math. Actually, I wasn't able to finish it, but it's, um, you would get 12 towers between the top and the bottom if you just did one line down and we're, we're a little bit wide too. So um, you actually end up with well, uh, dozens of potential towers. Um, in this, so maybe some sort of limit language or increase that that uh, number from 1,000 to a higher number. I, I don't know what it is, but um, otherwise I'd, you get five I'd, per mile. And I'd suggest we, if possible, stay away from a numeric limit of X number of towers because that without some some something to support where that number came from, it has picked a number. But a distance, that, that's a more logical thing. And that would probably work better with the telecommunications companies anyway, because they pretty much work off of triangulation. And so there's some, there's some information out there that we could probably uh, uh, find and determine what their typical spacing requirements are in their triangulations. Is the 500 feet, is that an arbitrary number? Or where do we come up with that? That goes, hmm? Good question, but I'm sure Charlene has an answer. No, I don't. <laughs> I, I think it just goes back to what was, uh, was typical at the time, uh, back in 1997. Well, sure. kind of a follow-up to that. Um, Thank you to staff for the uh, wonderful materials here. Uh, I'm just curious, is it possible to redo this map like at 350 feet or 100 feet just to see if that even opened up any more space in the, in the residential area? So you want a, a second and a third map with 350 foot radius? Kind of only, if only if it's easy to do. 
I mean, if you sent this away and it took him a week to process it, then I don't. Our you know. IT staff did that in house, so I'm sure they would be able to create maps with smaller radiuses for you. Yeah, I'm just curious to see what that would look like because that's. I mean, a lot of this area down here is residential, and I'm not convinced that this map would look any different if you shrunk that or along the same lines of where did our 500 feet originally come from? Okay. Yeah, Mr. Chair, um, a question on the uh, the, the 1,000 uh, foot um, criterion. That was that tied to a service limit or was it re relative was it an aesthetic kind of a thing so we don't have towers and too many too close together i'm i'm sorry i missed the first part of your question bob the I, I, it's yeah. aesthetics the, the limitation of of not being the towers not being closer than 1000 feet to each other was that an aesthetic kind of decision so they're not popping up everywhere or was it related in any way to cell phone service um, it's probably more of an industry standard. What we've seen in other ordinances, a thousand feet is pretty common. It's also used a lot in the freeway signs as well. Nobody wants to hear me talk about this. <laughs> I, I happen to believe that, you know, unless we can come up with a better idea, 500 feet is still a good idea within our city because I certainly don't want a cell tower in my backyard, nor do I want one just like we had before. I was really hoping when we got this ordinance we were going to see something different and unique and allow us to do things that are a little different than what we've been seeing before, like going to Tower Mart and sticking a tower on their sign up there. Because you only have to be about 30, 40 feet in the air to get cell coverage. You could go to the high school, you could go to, you know, the town center with their towers out there and come up with some unique idea of how we can allow them. They might be within 500 feet, but they're right on or in something that would make them work still for a cell user. I was looking for that type of stuff to come out of here, not just thinking that we're going to still allow towers. I mean. If it's going to have to be in residential areas, then we need to come up with something different and unique that maybe will work in there. And now we start talking about putting them in the tower at the town center. I mean, God knows how tall that is. But that's the kind of stuff I'm looking for. Go to the high school maybe and allow them. Maybe the old ordinance didn't let them go onto the school grounds, but there's that whole pit out there that's... Uh, runoff pit that maybe one could go out in that area. I, I'm really, I was looking for something totally different to come out of this ordinance, not just using our same old ordinance, because I still think, and even if you use the ordinance, use some of the things that other people do. And, you know, right in here they go, if you have a tower, then, and we talked about it at the cell tower out by Tower Mart, and I think Bob brought it up, and he goes, can you move it back? Well, maybe as high as you have the tower, it's got to be set back that many feet into the property. I don't know if that works. It was a concept, though, and we didn't have that luxury. And then, and I heard you say that we're not going to make this a conditional use, but is this still going to come back to the Planning Commission, just as an ordinance? Because every other city that you represented here except one requires a conditional use permit. Or a wireless permit. Well, no, they, and all the other cities require a conditional use permit. But if we have a wireless permit, are we gonna use it just like a conditional use permit and have it still yes. come back? That is staff's recommendation with this, yes. Yeah, and I've- Now you could choose to fine. make it an administrative permit and have it returned just to staff. Well, it is administrative if it's, only if it's going on a commercial piece of property. But I think that, you know, and I, I was trying to read some of these things. It's like you can have a, a tower that's close to a residential area, but these towers in every other city, I mean, they're 30 feet, 36 feet. 
They may not be able to be co-location towers, but maybe that's what we need to look for because if the one that came before us was in that tree line that was 30, 40 feet, 40 feet what the trees were gonna be, maybe that would have been something that we could have looked at. Well, when it sticks up twice as high as the tree, that doesn't seem realistic because that isn't what I'd want to see. So, you know, I, I saw though that throughout this, most of the people when they were really getting into this, it, particularly in a residential area, you try to make it where it's mounted on some sort of a building or a tower or a monument. And maybe that's what we need to look at also, where those permits, we can make them acceptable in those areas. And, you know, when you say it's absolutely not acceptable, I was looking and Jeremy brought up a great point because that whole business area that's down below Southport Bridgeway Lakes, where we're going to have the big shopping center and stuff, there's nowhere in that shopping, I mean, according to your map, that shopping center is going to be within 500 feet of residential. Correct. Because it's a mixed I, use. That village in Yarborough is a mixed use village. What about the golf course? We can't use well, the golf course? Well, that's the spot that's open. You could float the tower on the lake. That's that's, that's the fine. little thing that's open. You can but you know what? That's a possibility, but it doesn't show oh. in this map. Yeah. Uh, just to go back to one of your early points, our prior wireless ordinance allowed these types of facilities to be co-located on buildings and support, support structures like football stadium lights, tower mart signs, and we actually have some. There are wireless yeah. facilities on the River Point Marketplace freeway sign and also on the IKEA sign. So our prior ordinance port. allowed it. This one does too. That part hasn't changed. It's actually in definitions under C, co-location, the practice of sharing support structures and buildings by wireless telecommunication providers. So they don't necessarily have to co-locate on a tower. It can be on other types of structures. Well, so I that's think, still allowed. Yeah. But I mean, my point was, I mean, I think we should emphasize that in the residential areas and not an 80 foot tower because there's nowhere in a residential area that an 80 foot tower is going to be wanted by that neighborhood. So that is we something... have to come up with alternatives, but we have no alternatives and there's no setback to it. None of the things that we talked about at the Planning Commission when we tried to help that person, none of those things are in here. And I, I just thought maybe we should be looking at if it has, because it's highly possible that some carrier actually needs one of these towers. I don't know so that then that's would true. You, would you like us to look at adding in a clause whereby if these facilities are located on certain support structures that stealth the facilities um, and or inside of structures that they would be allowed uh, closer to residentially zoned property? Yes, I think that's, okay. what, that's what I'm getting at is, I mean, I think that's the type of stuff we should be looking at in this ordinance and try to get a little bit more aggressive in trying to figure out a way to help these people because I don't know how to help them without putting up an 80 foot tower, but I know those towers can go down to 40 or 50 feet and still be useful. Mm -hmm. So maybe in the residential area, I still don't want to see an 80 foot tower next to a residential parcel of property, but there might be alternatives to that where you could have a tree, a flagpole, maybe you're going to use a flagpole and we could go out into a park area, the school, and you like the flag, you do everything, but on top of it happens to be a little stick up in the air that makes the cell tower work. So, you know, I, I that's Good the kind suggestion. of stuff I'm really looking for in this ordinance because the 500 feet makes sense to me even today, like it did in 1997, and it was all the poles were like that, but all the poles had to be these huge, tall poles back then. And there's alternatives out there that we can use, and I'd just like to see us try to use those alternatives as a better case 
to get it closer to residential and then if we really had a problem and the guy says there's absolutely no where that i can get cell coverage from i need to have a tower then i think you still have to look and a couple of these ordinances said they could have a tower as tall as what was allowed in the area which i thought was kind of interesting however i have absolutely no idea how tall we could have a house out there anyway uh depends on the zone in the mixed use zone in southport that would probably give you your 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 greatest amount of height which i believe is 65 feet 65 for mm -hmm. a home that no that would be in the mixed use area yeah but so you're talking home. about you know how uh, high can a house be a house well 45 feet 40 40 or 45 feet well i mean that's that's the alternative i think i'm looking for when i'm looking at this ordinance going you know it said in there it can be as high as what's allowed in the zoning so if your zoning all of a sudden said you know you can build a house out here and it can be 40 feet okay so the tower can be 40 feet now if that helps somebody great if it i think it does because i think they can bring them down that and still get coverage you might have to put in two small towers to get better triangulation or whatever but i don't know i that's the kind of stuff i'm looking for in our ordinance i think it's important that we try to make it helpful for them to use a building and run off the building i think that's a grand idea and then we can get them closer to residential because it's hidden and nobody noticed so I mean, we actually use the rice mill or the rice towers out in the port too, you know, which was a great place to put them. So I think there's plenty of opportunity, but I think we really need to open our imagination to this, try to utilize what's around us out in Southport, looking at the school, or is the old ordinance, could they go on a school ground that was banned from a school ground or a park, right? No, they, they could have gone on the school grounds. In fact, there was one that was looking at attaching to the football stadium lights. However, it was it. within 500 feet of residential. Well, that'd be close though, wouldn't it? Out in the middle of that? Maybe there's something we could look at like that. If, if it's just gonna attach to something else, we can get it a little closer. So that it's not a tower, it's just attached to something. I think that's the kind of opportunities I'm looking to see out of our ordinance. I'm, I'm okay, hearing I'll... you, and I'm, I'm hearing a give and take. A give and take. If we're going to allow it near residential, um, we need to put some tougher restrictions on it, and or give them an opportunity. And to they fight. need to work hard at making it look or fit in. No, I, I agree. I what my suggestion would be. I think Charlie's ideas are all good ones. Um, I think. The focus should be on creative opportunities and encouraging the kind of act, the kind of um, uses that he's describing, rather than a prescriptive ordinance that says you can't do this. Better to say uh, the process is easier, or you can do um, single-purpose structures if you keep them at a certain height, or you co-locate on an existing structure. In other words, write your ordinance in a way that encourages the behaviors that you want. We can write it to not allow it, correct? Well, we not can't, allow it. That's the that's the thing is we we are we are not um, we don't write with a free hand in simply prohibiting cell towers somewhere because they have a right under federal law to locate facilities as needed. We have rights to regulate them on aesthetic grounds, and there's a tension between those two rights. So better to write an ordinance that encourages them to put their antenna where you want them to be rather than trying to write a prescriptive ordinance that says you can't do what you want to do. Does that make sense? Which is what I hear Charlie saying. That, that's what I'm trying to say. I yeah. mean, I thought our ordinance, and I still believe our ordinance is fine because I think there was a purpose behind it. And it's still there today. You don't want it in your backyard. And that, no one does. So, with that being said, if we have to have tower, then we should have some of the setback requirements so we could move it like we talked or something but we should encourage it to go on to structures that a football field uh 
tower marked sign the the signs around you know and if we have a problem in our park area and we'll assume that we want to put one out you know in one of the parks the city owns then instead of it trying to be an 80 foot high tree which we don't grow in West Sacramento make it a 40 or a 50 foot tree that'll blend into the trees that are currently there and nobody would even know it was in existence so I think those are the type of things I've been thinking about I was concerned that every other jurisdiction had a conditional use permit but I think you've answered that question for me and uh, some of these you know they were saying that they just allow anything that was mounted onto a facade or I'm assuming that means a building a football upright whatever so you know I think those are the type of things we should be really looking at trying to encourage and discourage in residential the really high poles okay I'm done talking yeah go in order of hands that I saw uh, mr. chase um, just I, I couldn't help I'm so fortunate to be sitting next to the sage here at this <laughs> table um, it was reminding me of the you know decade-long discussion of parking lot lighting <coughs> heights I mean they started out very high because you get the maximum photometrics, but they're not that attractive. To get them more pedestrian friendly, we lower the height, but as we lower it, we know we need more of them. Uh, but yet, I think oftentimes, that is the better solution, to have more smaller ones to blend into the tree heights. And perhaps somehow, I mean, I, I, to me, the same logic could apply here, that if you reduce the height, you will be allowed to have them closer together uh, to provide coverage. Sandy. Um, I, I want to thank staff for working on this. Uh, this was really responsive to, to us as when we brought up that we were getting a, we wanted more guidance and so I, I appreciate the work. Um, with regard to, and I, I also really appreciated the, the review that was done of other policies. I think that's, that's really helpful. For me, with, with the exception of the monopole, I, I like the idea that's being put forward here that it's kind of a multi-purpose kind of facility. Some things, in the Santa Cruz, and I know that they're very restrictive in terms of some of their uh, policies. I just found that, that, that some of their approach, that, that facade mounted and roof mounted equipment required an administrative permit, but all other facilities required CUP and design review or so, something like that. I think that might be something that some of us or most of us would, um, would find uh, useful or helpful for us. It also has the, in, within a residential, they prohibit the um, wireless facilities unless it can be demonstrated that a facility would eliminate or substantially reduce one or more service gaps. I think that that's important to us too. For me, I do, you know, um, Ms. Allen shared with us that our safety, um, uh, safety folks are relying more and more on wireless. I, I think there's an obligation for sa for us to be considering safety in the city. So I, I think we do have to have to deal with how we're going to be locating these facilities within residential or near residential um, areas. So I, for some reason that when I was reading through and trying to figure out, okay, if I had to pick one of these sets, and I know we don't, I know we can mix and match and do what, what's West Sac for us, but there were some things within the Santa Cruz thing that just resonated with me when I was reading the, the uh, document. So again, I, I think I, I'm really grateful that this got taken up. I, I know how limited staff resources are right now, given our budget constraints in the city. So, and, but I also know that we're going to have more and more folks coming forward to us as, as we've seen. And so we need, I think we need to shore this up before we take more applications. So I appreciate it. Thanks. Joe. Yeah, I, I uh, actually agree with what Charlie said. I, those are some of the points that I, I did want to cover. I won't rehash them, but, um, uh, I, I had a had a hard time accepting going from uh, the 500 feet to zero, um, and and I would like to see some sort of buffer, uh, even if it's a minimal buffer. Uh, and I, I I too am not sure what that 500 foot uh, reason was for. If that was arbitrary or, but but I know that I wouldn't want to walk out and see that, you know, in my backyard either. So I, I have I have a hard time going there uh, to nothing because that opens it up to right there. Um, and I recall as Ms. Hill gave the presentation, I thought uh, she said something about a minimum higher height on these. But as I see uh, some of the other uh, cities, they go as low as 45 feet. Uh, and 
maybe you can clarify for me, is, is that a direct correlation? If you had them 30 feet, you could get the same amount of coverage as long as you had more? Or is it something to do with the building around those towers, how they bounce off, how they hit each other? In, in terms of that, um, I did speak with someone in the industry about heights, and they said that there are issues having to do with topography with other buildings with either with even large trees that is one thing they have to take into consideration when they figure out how tall it has to be so, so a large tree or a structure could interfere with yes how that signal hits it could even cause if i had more towers it could still interfere with that it it could cause them to have to put up more towers to compensate if, for instance, it's bouncing off a building or if a tree is interfering with it, it may cause more towers to get the same coverage was what I was told. And, you know, not, not being familiar with the cost to carriers to rent, I'm sure at some point it becomes cost prohibitive to rent from multiple tower to multiple tower. I wouldn't know what that, that point is, but I would agree that uh, uh, within the residential areas, we have to try something different as opposed to just sticking that structure out there on the Vickers lot in the 80 foot tall structure. And, and I would like to see, uh, you know, it's worth discussion, some sort of buffer from uh, the residents uh, so that we're not gonna put it 10 feet uh, from somebody's front yard. Okay, does that give staff enough direction? Yes, I think so. Um, <laughs> no, this, it was really Albeit good. from multiple angles. Uh, really good uh, comments, and I think we can come back to you with something that is a lot closer. Uh, so this was a good first step. Um, I do want to clarify one thing, just to make sure I heard right. So we're looking at um, trying to stay with a wireless telecommunications permit, which is going to act a lot like a conditional use permit. It will be heard by the Planning Commission, maybe with the possibility that we could have some that are administratively reviewed uh, if they are ones that are either going on in, well, there's, there's already the requirement for if it's going on an existing co-location that it's strictly just a building permit. We can't require any sort of entitlement there. But um, if they were to locate on an actual building or within a building or on some other existing support structure like a flagpole, is that something that this commission would uh, like to see possibly as an administrative process or do they want that would to we, come back? Would we see that like we used to where it's just a zoning administrator action? We could set it up to be a zoning administrator action on those. Would that be acceptable? We, we certainly can. Yeah. And then I think, I think that, it, you know, and I'm only speaking for myself here, but I think I'd still like to see what's going on, at least in the beginning, to make sure our ordinance is doing what we thought it should be doing. Now, the zoning administrator, remember, that's not something that comes to the Planning Commission. Well, uh, that's but we do I post it for we you. We used to do that, though, with even the zoning administrator action to approve cell towers, we still saw where they were going. We probably could yeah, create a clause where could. wireless permits would right. be, uh, be ratified differently than we currently now treat building administrator actions. You're, I think you're referring to how it used to come back. Um, sometimes they were put on as for ratification, although I think that's pretty much what they yeah, were. Well, yeah. Then we changed the ordinance a couple of years ago to eliminate some of those. But there's no reason why the. Well, I mean, I think the new you know, from my this, my standpoint in the beginning, if you think that that's a little easier step i don't care but i would still like to see what's going on with them in the very beginning and then if it goes along fairly well and we want to change it in a year or so that might be fine but i think in the very beginning i'd like to see what's going on out there with this yeah, currently the nothing prohibits the zoning administrator from <clears throat> bringing in I reporting an item up to planning commission so we could just do that as sort of an administrative policy I wonder if it's possible to see uh, what a 
pole would look like that's mounted on, say, a flagpole or, or something like that, uh, uh, that's big enough to have three carriers on it, what something like that would look like? Is it, I don't think you would get three carriers. Yeah, though. you may not get three. You might get just one. Just and they're one. usually like the whip antennas. They're, they're pretty slim jim. Uh, the whip antennas is what would go on those. There's one in Grass Valley. <clears throat> And that's what it's like. It's like a whip antenna on top of a flagpole. But all people see are the flag that's whipping in the wind, and they have lights on it. So it looks like a flagpole in a school, but on the very top is a little whip antenna. And where they have their equipment, I have no idea. But I know that's what it is. Mr. Chase? Just one quick question, um, Charlene. I, I know we're a... Uh, we pride ourselves on being a green city and sustainable. Um, under item H, it, under minimum application requirements, uh, it requires 10 sets of plans. Um, is, is that actually necessary, would you say, or can that be reduced to one? Uh, we can take a look at that. That has been our past uh, number for routing to all the various departments that need to review those. It goes to building, uh, planning, development engineering, um, it'll go to police and fire. Um, so, but we can take a look at that, and we are going more digital these days. Ten sets of plans are one of those little round things. Going off of Charlie's comment, I know um, sometimes it's nice to see the administrative actions. Um, I would personally probably yield that if it went to design review instead. Um, but that's just. We could have that, couldn't we, if we made it? Do you mean planning commission do design review or use the no. design review process? Use the design review process. Or when they're, they're attaching yeah, to an existing building or support structure? Not sending it to to the commission. So if it goes to design review, yeah, I mean, Charlie wants I'm not to, a, to I'm see I'm not it. totally <laughs> against it, but what I'm telling you is I think in the very start of our ordinance, for the first year or two, I think we should see all the applicants and see what they're doing. And then as you start seeing that they use their imagination, then in, you know, pretty soon Charlene will go, this is a pain in the neck. We need to cut this process a little bit. <laughs> and that's fine because we will then have figured out that what we've designed is working. But I think I would, my opinion again today, I would like to see what we originally are trying to do to make sure we're do it's going the way we thought it was going to go. That's my thought. You can write it any way you want. We'll talk about it. <laughs> it would be about the same process and reality. And, and design review, we would then have to probably add something into the design review. Because currently, well, if you. I, I don't know that you would want to. I think what, what I hear you saying is that if we're going to write an ordinance on this, that the process, the administrative process, could be like the design review. You wouldn't want to necessarily shoehorn this into design review because that carries with it baggage. A, a lot of baggage that comes that isn't really necessary if all you're doing is sticking an antenna on the end of a flagpole. But um, but you could have a process like that that involves a you know a notification posting of something and a period of time for anybody to come and, and raise objections. Uh, function like a like the design review. Um, we also mentioned uh, uh, grounds for withdrawal to be added, just summarizing. Yeah, that would come probably through the conditions of approval that would be associated with this type of permit. Um, is that something that this commission would like to see? What might be a list of the typical conditions that would be associated with this permit? Well, I, mean, I think it would be exciting to hear Jeff go look this up. But if a guy put up a flagpole and then the flag decided to tear apart and he didn't put a flag back on it, what happens? Uh, that'd be a nuisance. Yeah. It would be a nuisance. nuisance but abatement. I mean, I don't know if could you could revoke abatement. but I mean, that's the type of stuff I think we're talking about. Well, I, I do think that what you're talking about, what I hear is things similar to issues with signs. Right? Somebody puts up a sign yeah. and then they're failing to maintain their sign or they abandon it then they may be in violation of the, both of the conditions of their sign permit, but also it may constitute a nuisance. Uh, so if, you, if there are conditions that say, you know, if you're going to stick up an 80-foot tall tower, you have to maintain it, and you fail to maintain it, that would be a basis for revoking the permit. Right. 
Boy, will you have fun now. Mona can hardly wait. I knew it. Okay. I think we've got quite a bit here. Okay. Um, so I need to inform the audience that the public hearing on this item is currently scheduled for September 15th. Uh, our next meeting of August 18th has been canceled. So the next scheduled meeting that I have on my calendar is September 1st. That is correct. Okay. And when this does return, it will be for a recommendation to the city council because this will also need to go to city council. Okay. Is there any informal discussion this evening? And I'm looking motion to adjourn. Motion and second. Second. Seconded by Ms. Sandine. All in favor? Aye. 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 Nose. Hearing none. Closed.